Mr. Jesse Powell back with us today, and his son Levi is joining. Levi is not. I'm going to be doing the preaching today, to my knowledge, but we're glad to have you here, Levi. And um, those of you who've met Levi before, make him feel welcome and um, enjoy his company. We're glad that Jesse can um, come up from Peoria, and um, we've scheduled Jesse from time to time be pre to be preaching here. Uh, all of us who've been around a while have heard Jesse before and really appreciated his messages and so every, I don't know, three or four weeks is probably what it'll average out to. Um, Jesse will be making that trek up here, Lord willing, and sharing God's word with us. So um, please listen with attentive ears. And we, we won't do this often. We'll, we'll give Jesse a hand of welcome one time. And you won't get a hand every time, but we're, I'll give you a hand now, too. We're so right. glad to have you here, and we look forward to hearing God's message. Thank Thursday. you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, it's, it's interesting because when I first... Uh, came here relocating from Anchorage, Alaska. We lived in Moni, and we commuted to Peoria. Now we're living in Peoria and sometimes commuting up here to Moni. You just, I, I just love you guys. There's no getting, getting rid of me. No getting rid of me. Uh, I'd like to ask you to open up your Bibles, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, title of the message is, there is a way that seems right to man. Obviously, you're familiar with that passage from, uh, from different parts of Scripture, but uh, particularly the Proverbs. But we're going to be looking at it as it's found in the story of Samuel, uh, particularly the story of Saul and some of the mistakes he had made. Just to make sure we all can remember the, the overall historical setting, roughly speaking in round figures, it's about 1000 B.C., it's the transition between the, the, the kingdom of Saul, the, the kingship of Saul is coming to a conclusion. The kingship of David is, uh, is about to start. And we're going to be seeing uh, the fundamental reason why the kingdom was taken away from Saul and given to David. I'm going to ask you to uh, please pray with me before I read scripture together. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, we pray, as we look into your word. Grant us the grace to draw from it the life that you have placed in it. Enable your servant, I pray, to speak forth the word of God in our midst so that we all hear and respond in ways that indeed are glorifying to your name, Lord Jesus Christ. We, we fix our eyes on you, and we are so, so profoundly grateful and thankful that you are the man after God's own heart who yielded always to your Father's will. Lord, I would pray that as we read this and as your Spirit speaks to us, help us if there are ways in which we have forgotten. As a song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Lord, if there is wandering away, Bring us back, O oh Lord, we pray. And as we find ourselves remembering to live by faith, may we remember, as the other song said, it is by grace alone. Bless us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We will be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 13. Now Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel, and 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah and Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. 
Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now, the is, now Israel has become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Let me pause a moment there. You may have a translation that says it was 30,000 chariots. There is some question as to the specific uh, passage, whether it was 3,000 or, or 30,000. Um, I don't think we need to quibble about that. I, I do th tend to think that the, given the number of charioteers being 6,000, 3,000 might be the more uh, precise uh, uh, textual uh, inclusion there. But if your passage, if your Bible passage says something else, that's that's the precise reason. Okay. Um, they went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. Verse six. When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. Pause. Earlier, and I believe it was 1 Samuel 10, Saul was told, go down to Gilgal. Samuel told Saul, go down to Gilgal. I'll meet you there in seven days. Wait for me. Well, in the meantime, all of these events have happened, and Saul is getting a little nervous. Samuel's not showing up, and we see what he does. Verse 9, so he said, Bring me the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offerings. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin, and Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about 600. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me ask you, what is, what's your compass when you're trying to navigate your way through life? You've got important decisions to make. We all know what a compass is, right? I, I must admit, I've always has some difficulty operating a compass. It's never really cooperated with me. I'm not sure. What, but we all know how a compass is supposed to. Supposed to you're able to, supposed to, to find your direction. So let me ask you, when you're trying to find your way through life and you have an important decision to make, what's your compass? Now, we know that we're all to live by faith, but I ask you in practicality, what does that really mean? What would it look like to not live by faith. Believe this, what we see particularly in this passage and why the kingship was taken away from Saul. I've often taught people, this is my, my summary explanation or, or definition of faith. Faith is trusting, in, trusting God enough to obey his commands even when they don't make sense. Okay? Faith is trusting God enough to obey his commands even when they don't make sense. It's kind of related to, I don't know if you ever heard it, uh, fa uh, submission isn't submission until you disagree. Think about it. Submission isn't submission until you disagree. It's when the person who's leading you says, we go this way, and you're the one who's supposed to follow, and you go, I'm not sure if that's the best choice. And you choose to submit even when your leader's 
saying something you don't quite agree with. That's submission. Well, faith is trusting God enough to obey his commands even when they don't make sense. Now, let's be, if, you, if you've walked with the Lord any time, a lot of times God's commands make perfect sense. A lot of times. But if you've walked with the Lord for any length of time, then you also have, have experienced those occasions when you go, God, are, are, you, are you really sure? And you choose to obey him even when he doesn't seem to make sense at the time. So what's your compass? We see this man of the flesh, this Saul, who was choosing a way that seemed right in his mind, and he was trusting his eyes, he was trusting his mind, he was trusting his feelings instead of God's word. Now, God's word is the lamp to our feet. God's word is the lamp to our path, right? And our eyes, our feelings, our mind, they're not evil. They're, they're part of our human nature, but they're not the compass. They're not the compass. They help us understand the compass and read the compass and use the compass, but they're not the compass, and that's what we would especially want to remember. Look with me at verse, uh, excuse me, 1 Samuel 13, 11, and 12. I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. I thought... Now that the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You can probably see the outline there pretty transparent there. Think with me about a way that seems right to men. And I invite you and me, as we hear this message, are there ways in my pilgrimage, in my walk of faith, that I've, as a song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, have I allowed these temptations to be influencing my walk with God. We need to beware your eyes. They don't see everything. But our eyes aren't the only problem. We need to beware your mind. It can talk you into anything. Okay? It can. It can. Not only our eyes and our mind, we need to beware your feelings. For they can shift on the slightest thing. Okay? Again, our eyes aren't evil, our mind isn't evil, our feelings aren't evil, but insofar as we're fallen creatures, they can lead us astray. They're not the compass. What's the compass? God's word. So, if you've heard me preach before at all, one of the ways I try to keep people engaged in my preaching, I'll invite us every once in a while to say something together. So, would you say that with me, please? Beware your eyes. They don't see everything. Okay? Keep that in mind. They don't see everything. Look what, Paul, look, me, look what Saul was seeing, though. He was seeing the men, excuse me, are scattering. Does anyone remember? This is not a rhetorical question. If you remember, you shout it out or raise your hand. How many people were, did Saul have together? There were so many with him in Michmash, another so many with his son Jonathan. Altogether there were? You want to remember? 3,000 altogether. 2,000 with Saul and 1,000 with Jonathan. At the end, when Saul counts it, anyone remember how many were left? 600. If I count that correctly, I think that's 80%. Okay? Imagine yourself going on a business venture or uh, any expedition where you've rallied your resources together, you, you've anticipated the challenge, you, you recognize that it's a formidable challenge, and you bring your resources together, and 80% of them are gone. Gone. What I really, really, really want us to do is not make Saul's mistake, but also appreciate how Saul was tempted to make the mistake that he made. He saw 80% of his resources scattering. He's seeing that Samuel is not coming up at the appointed time. So, Samuel, you told me you would come here in seven days. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, I actually did pretty good coming to church. We commuted from Peoria today. 
my wife and I have diff kind of different philosophies on, on arriving on time. <laughs> okay? If my wife is not five minutes early, she's late. If I'm arriving in the minute I'm supposed to be there, I'm on time. If I'm supposed to be there at 8 o'clock and it's 8 o'clock and 59 seconds, I'm, I'm on time. I tend to not, I'm getting much better, I must admit. We call it uh, allowing for margin. Uh, <laughs> I've learned to allow for margin. But what's happening? Saul is looking around for Samuel. And Sa Samuel's supposed to be here in seven days. It's the seventh day. And Samuel's not around. Now, is the seventh day over yet? No. And that's exactly the point. The seventh day had arrived, and Saul is jumping to conclusions. But he's, the, the, he sees his men scattering. He sees that Saul, Samuel uh, is not coming at the set time, so he thought. And he, he clearly sees the Philistines assembling. Now we're, again, we don't know exactly how many, whether it's 3,000, 30,000, but there's a sizable force. There's a sizable force for 3,000 uh, soldiers of Saul to face. There is a massive army if it's only 600. So, again, look with Saul's eyes at what he is seeing. His men are scattering. Uh, Samuel's not showing up. The enemy is assembling. And it's easy to forget at that moment what you and I both know. We are to live by faith, not by sight. We need to beware our eyes because why? They don't see everything. What was it specifically that Saul had missed? Let me walk with me. See, faith sees the invisible. Say with me Hebrews 11.1. 1. You know it. Say it together. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Okay? Faith sees the invisible. We are certain that that which cannot be seen with the human eye is still nevertheless absolutely certain. Say with me Hebrews 11.27. By faith Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. And this is what I particular, it's the one who is invisible that Saul had forgotten. Now, I'm not a mathematician. Like I said, I'm not good with compasses. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have this correct. But if I'm wrong, you can correct me. If I have a number, a large number, say 235 million, and I multiply 235 million by zero, what do I have? Good. I got that one right. I, th I, th I was pretty sure about that one. I'm pretty sure about that one. This is the one I'm not absolutely sure about. Now, if I have a very, very small number, 0. 0.00025, okay, and I multiply it by infinity, what do I have? Thank you. I do. I, I, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> So, faith sees him who is invisible. So, what did Saul's eyes see? He saw a loss of 80% of his resources, and he saw 600 left over. What did he not see? The one who is infinite in his midst. But let's not easily poo-poo and roll our eyes at Saul Let's recognize that our own temptation to see the circumstances we're in and fall into that trap of failing to see him who is invisible in our midst. Our eyes are not the, the, the reliable source unless, of course, they are the eyes of faith that sees the invisible. But we need to beware our eyes for they don't see everything by nature. We, we need to recognize that. But like I said, it's not just your eyes. It's, it's your mind as well. So say it with me, please, number two. Beware your mind. It can talk you into anything, okay? It can. I thought, well, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's 
favor. Sam, this, uh, you can almost hear uh, Saul thinking out loud. Samuel is false to his word. He said he was going to be here. He's not here. Samuel is showing disrespect to the Lord's anointed. I'm the Lord's anointed. Why isn't Samuel is here? Samuel should be waiting for me instead of me waiting for him. Can you hear him? Think? I don't know. See, I'll be honest with you. Those thoughts sound too close to what I would very easily be thinking at the time. I will be honest with you. I, 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 I can see a lot of Saul's mistakes, at least those potentials for those mistakes, in my own fallen nature. And we need to beware our mind because it can talk us into anything. <laughs> Listen to the logic, okay? Listen to the logic. Okay, we're talking about our mind. Listen to the logic of Saul. I have not sought the Lord's favor. I better sin against him quickly. No, seriously. I've not sought the Lord's favor, so what do I do? I better sin against him quickly because he's not supposed to offer the burnt. Who's supposed to offer the burnt? The peace is supposed to do that. He's supposed to, Samuel's supposed to come and do that. It's not, it's not his, his job description. But what do you call that? When your mind is able to talk you into something that is clearly a sin, but it seems so reasonable at the time. I call that a rational lie. Okay? When we rationalize something, what we're doing is we can be very skilled at telling ourselves rational lies. They seem very reasonable. Only one problem. It contradicts the word of God. And so let's... Be mindful of the temptation to let our minds lead us astray. And keep in mind, we're not the only ones trying to talk us into sin. We're not alone in this. Genesis 3.13 says, you know the story in the Garden of Eden. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul talking about the uh, deception says, I'm afraid that Jesus, the, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may be somehow led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Let me just pause right there, beloved, and ask you about your sincere and your pure devotion to Christ. My prayer is that you love the Lord. That you sincerely love the Lord. And that you love the Lord from a pure heart. But let us be honest with ourselves. Temptation comes to us from so many sources. We have indeed the, the, great, the, tri the world, the flesh, and the devil seeking to lead us astray. And I just ask you to think about in your own walk with God, your Sincere devotion to Christ. The purity of your devotion to Christ. Are there ways in which you've allowed your mind to take hold of a very rational lie? I have no idea what form it might take, but I'm absolutely convinced in the power of the Holy Spirit to take a message like this and communicate to you in such a to bring your conscience and to awaken you up, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm asking you to open yourself up to the leading of the Holy Spirit. If there are ways in which, like Samuel, like Saul, like myself, we can easily allow our, our minds to lead us astray from sincere and pure devotion. Christ. And beloved, if that is the case, if your conscience is convicting you, we know what we do, right? We bring it to Christ. We bring it to Christ and ask for forgiveness. Prone to wander, Lord, and I've wandered away. Lord, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Father, forgive me and help me to keep to that path that I know that I'm to keep to. So there's a couple ways already. 
We've considered ways that seem right. Uh, bewaring our eyes. They, they don't see everything. Beware your mind. It can talk you into anything. But remember that verse that talks about our feelings as well. Say with me number three. Beware your feelings. They can shift on the slightest thing. Have you ever experienced that where um, you... I, I remember when I was a nephew. Excuse me, when I was an uncle. I remember when, when I was an uncle and I thought I knew everything about parenting. <laughs> and I remember my, my sister, who had a couple sons at the time, telling me, oh, how different her two boys are. And I remember thinking, they're two peas in a pod. Who are you kidding? Now, if any of you have children, you know how different your children can be. And I'm not going to embarrass Levi here, but he, Levi knows that I love Levi and I love Elizabeth, but, but they're very, very different in, 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 in wonderful ways. But the, the ways in which I've seen as a father in my own life, it's seen in my own children, how, how our feelings, we can be feeling very strongly one way and it can shift on a dime at times, at times. What does Paul say? I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Remember, he's seeing what he's seeing. He's uh, thinking what he's thinking. And so he says, I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. This is a question you should you would do well to really, this is one of my fundamental principles of Christian living. I have about five of them. One of them is this. God calls me to a commandment-oriented lifestyle. God calls me to a commandment-oriented lifestyle, which describes you. Our, if it comes between your feelings and the word of God, which is going to wear out? Which, which is going to win out? Okay? God calls us to a commandment-oriented lifestyle. I pray that you're remembering to that, but I pray you're also mindful of the areas for temptation. Now, as we kind of conclude this message, I want to take some time to, to think through Saul's mistake. You caught what Saul's mistake was, right? It goes on to say it explicitly. In fact, it says it twice. You've acted foolishly. Samuel said, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Verse 13 goes on, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So you see what's going on in Saul's life at the moment. He's trusting himself. He's trusting his sight. He's trusting his mind. He's trusting his feelings more than God and specifically more than God's word. Okay? Did you observe God's solution? solution what what was the solution god proposed or what his, what his plan in in this the lord has sought out a man after god his own heart and appointed him leader of his people now obviously this is a in the original context this is david but i want to think with you about one who's greater than david to which david pointed us to so we have saul making the common mistakes of mankind the kingdom being taken away from him and given to David. But David, like you and I, is a fallen creature. And so, yes, he is the man after God's heart, but I want to look with you at the one greater than David, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you have your Bibles with me. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I'm not going to take the time to read all of verses 1 through 11. You're familiar with it. It's the story of the temptation of Jesus. Just remind you of what you, I trust you already know. Here we have the man after God's own heart facing the same temptations to allow his feelings, his mind, his, 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 his sight to lead him astray. And what is it that... Jesus uses again and again and again to defend himself. What does he say? It is written. It is written. It is written. He's trusting himself. Here's a trick, here's a trick question. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus man? 
Is Jesus both? Don't minimize the humanity of Jesus. Don't minimize the humanity of Jesus. Every temptation you, f- you feel within your soul, Jesus felt as well. The temptation to let his eyes, his mind, his feelings lead him astray, he's feeling it, he's thinking it, he's, he's interacting with it, and every time when he's faced with it, he says, it is written, it is written, it is written. Turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Verse 36 through 39. Story of Jesus, the man after God's own heart, the one greater than David. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, you're familiar with the story. Verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And notice what he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Have you ever been shattered? Some of you are too young. You haven't been shattered. You probably will be. I've been shattered a few times. Where you are just crushed. I have no idea what that relates to, what Christ is going through. But I have experienced in my life times where you are just shattered. I think that's something along what Jesus was going through. He's overwhelmed to the point of death. So much so, you know, Look at Jesus. What does he do? He throws himself on the ground. He weeps so much that his tears are mixed with blood. There's there's something going on. His soul is so gut-wrenchingly sore because of what he's about to go through. And what does he say? Your will be done. He wrestles with God, but he resolves by the Father, this hurts a lot, but your will be done. Look at Jesus, please. One more, one more passage, please. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, beginning with verse 41. There's been some mocking already going on. Jesus is actually on the cross. He, there's already been mocking going on. In verse 41, he says, In the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. Then we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who knows what psalm that's from? Psalm tw- turn with me to Psalm 22. Yes, the one who is greater than David is dying on the cross, taking up a psalm of David, Psalm 22, which begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? There's two other quick passages I want to point your attention. I hope you have your Bibles with me, with you. Verse 8. I think, personally, it was this word in verse 8 that particularly, although Psalm 22 could have been written from the foot of the cross. But Psalm, uh, Psalm 22, verse 8 says, 
He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. That sounds kind of familiar, don't it? So David, in a moment of despair, expresses his walk of faith by writing Psalm 22. The one greater than David, in a moment of ultimate crisis, finds himself, the very words of Psalm 22, hurled at him. He takes up the beginning words of Psalm 22, but notice with me, please, where Psalm 22 concludes. Turn with me to Psalm 22, verse 22. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Okay? Please let me take this whole point together. We looked at Saul and the mistakes he had made. And I pray that we've seen a little bit of ourselves in those mistakes. But then we've looked to the one who is greater than David, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I remind you, if at any point your conscience has convicted you about ways in which you've fallen into these mistakes, look to Christ and, re- and be encouraged to remember he, who, he is the faithful one who always yielded himself continually and faithfully to, your, to his Father. And because of that, we can be forgiven. And let us press on to not fall into the same mistakes again. Remind me of some of those mistakes we want to avoid. Say with me, please. Beware your eyes. They don't see everything. Right. It's not just our mi- eyes, but our mind. Uh, say it with me, please. Beware your mind. It can talk you into anything. And finally, number three, beware your feelings. They can shift on the slightest thing. Let's be thankful that our Savior never took that path. And let's also devote ourselves to staying far from it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your steadfast perseverance in always doing what your Father delighted in. We thank you that you are able to sympathize with our temptations and recognize how easy it is for us to lose our way. Lord, Help us to put this message into practice, fixing our eyes upon you, Jesus, and committing to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.